Mick uh, asked me to do this topic and I said, oh, look, I actually don't know that much about animal welfare. Um, and I suggested some other names. And he said, oh, well, we really want a perspective of a person who's not really necessarily an expert in animal welfare, just a farmer. And I um, thought about it for 24 hours and I thought, actually, I do need to tackle this topic and I do need to understand it more. So I'm speaking to you today as um, absolutely not an expert, just, um, and I'm going to share with you um, a range of views. I did, however, do a bit of research and I tracked down a bloke called Greg Mills, who I coincidentally went to primary school with, and I lent on all our primary school content, uh, um, contacts to say, um, can you help give me some information? So some of the stuff I'm going to show you today um, comes from Greg, and then some of it comes from Charlie Arnott. Um, and I don't know, have, have people been exposed to the thinking? OK, so you're going to see some of the work from the Centre for Food Integrity, I think they call it, in the US. Um, I learnt something really important during the year as the Rural Woman of the Year. Um, and it was an interesting thing. I'm going to show you our farm in a moment, but our piggery business is actually our smallest business. But I learnt that whatever your project is, is how you end up getting named. And I had a project around commercialising the biogas technology in the piggery industry. So I actually got a name, and which was really um, kind of bemusing for me, of being called the pig lady during my year. And so I'd kind of started off being a bit embarrassed about photos like this, but by the end of the year I realised that this is probably one of the most important things I could do. Instead of actually going and talking to farming audiences about farming and the challenges, that what I actually needed to do was to go talk to all urban audiences about farming, and that's actually the direction I set off in as a result of doing that. I also did 55 presentations during that time, and I met thousands and thousands of people because you go everything from an audience of 100 people to an audience of 1,000 people. And I had the most fascinating, I could only call it the best year of consumer research I've ever done in my life because I asked people what they thought and what they knew about farming. And this is what I found out, is that they actually don't understand very much about food production that in a modern supermarket environment where most people are buying their food, there is no connection to real farmers. Most people are really time poor. What they talked about is, is we wanted more convenience, they want nutritious, healthy food, they want to be able to count on us to deliver that for their families. But the other thing that I also learned is, is that this is not the picture of an Australian farmer. And so I said, well, what is an Australian farmer? And they said, firstly, it's a bloke, he's old and he's wearing a hat. Well, oh, God, that's really interesting. And I actually then, it made me think back to when the Woman's Weekly, because um, Ed, who I think is here today, organised for us to be in the Woman's Weekly in our year. And um, they rang up, and luckily I didn't take this phone call, <laughs> because they said, we wanted to be ready on this day, and this is what we wanted to wear. We want her to wear a striped shirt, a pair of jeans, R.M. Williams boots, a dry as a bone, and a Nakubra hat. And so I luckily only got that as a message and which I flatly refused to do. I did acquiesce with the striped shirt only because I always wear them anyway. So I said, I'll do anything I normally do. I would wear anything I would normally wear, but I'm not going to project an image of rural Australia, which is not actually who we are. So it was very interesting learning all of that. But what I wanted to do first was actually talk about how dynamic farming is these days. And in my farming lifetime, I just want to tell you where I come from. And, and how much things have changed and why I think one of the key drivers around what's happening in welfare is a, um, a driver we can do something about as farmers. This is, this is absolutely within our control and I want that message to, to come across today. So my grandmother and her husband took up 940 acres near a, a town called Chinchilla in Queensland. They ran a dairy farm, they milked 60 cows, they had five kids, they built a community. They helped run the local co-op, which not only sold all their product, it also was the only and main retailer in the town. That town now has KFC and McDonald's. Um, and that's called progress as well. My mother and father continued in the same vein. They took on more land. They had three kids. They kept building a community. We had a 240 head commercial cattle, cattle stud, which is why I put the Charolais in. They look a bit skinny, because I think I've elongated the photo too much. Um, and we conservation cropped. My life has the same threads, but it looks completely different. So I'm a partner in a farming business. We employ 35 families. We market some of our own product. The majority of what we produce is exported, and we receive 25, on average, 25% less rainfall than any previous generation in Western Australia. So in the last 15 years, we've seen the retail chains, 
emerge as the predominant communication mechanism with consumers. Food has gone global. Supply chains now cross all boundaries across the world. Food has become entertainment, as we've seen with the MasterChef phenomena. Celebrity chefs have now emerged as key trendsetters in the food industry. And climate change, and I don't know whether you can see the cow over the side who's saying, I think it's the sheep. Climate change has become, yeah, as you would if you're a cow, climate change has become, it's actually the pig, but anyway, we won't go into that because, no, all right, Anne, no, APL's over here, so I have to be, really behave myself and say good things about the pig industry all day. But climate change has become an accepted phenomena, even if you don't call it climate change. In Western Australia, you have to say climate variability because climate change is, is, is you know, it's a harder, it's a harder um, concept for people um, to adopt. But red meat's the bad guy. It's also been in an absolute explosion of social networking and new media forms. And the biggest change of all, the size and scale of a modern family farm has changed dramatically. But in that time, our commitment to do the right thing has never been stronger. And my commitment to build a community, to care for our animals, to be great land stewards and to provide good leadership to my industries is no different to my grandparents and it is no different to my parents. So, for the farmers in the room, you're now going to be happy. I'm going to show you our farm. <laughs> so, we run a broad acre operation. Canola, wheat, lupins and barley is our rotation. We also have oat and hay and straw. It's a five and a half thousand hectare cropping operation. We also, as Mick said, have developed an orchard and this is actually our dam at the orchard. This is our favourite photo. Everyone else wants to see pictures of oranges and trees. We just want to look at pictures of water. And I have to tell you, for anyone who has had a drop in rainfall like what we've experienced in Western Australia, water has become the new and really, really important asset that we have. So we did this to target the fresh, um, to, to replace fresh fruit that's coming into Western Australia because 60% of all the fresh fruit that we consume in Western Australia comes from outside Western Australia, either interstate or overseas. Happy days, first oranges. So it's a very big development and it hurt quite a lot is really the best way I can describe that project. Anyone who's been through a development process will understand what I mean. This is our piggery. It's a 650 um, sow farrow to finish operation. Farrowing's in two locations and the grow out is in eco, what we call eco shelters in Wongan Hills. But for those of you who probably know, it's just a clear span shed, but we call them eco shelters. Um, we grow on straw and we take the straw I wonder if I've got a picture of that. No, I don't. It's a picture of our mill. Um, one of the ways we value out our grain is that we have about 5,000 tonnes of storage on the farm, and that enables us to put our feed grain, which is typically your lowest, gra lowest grade grain, through our feed mill and actually becomes our highest grade grain because we get the most for it by feeding it to the pigs. So what is one of the key drivers in animal production in this welfare debate? It is definitely about our understanding of food production, and it's a very, very key issue. You've heard this today. I just thought, you know, I'll throw a stat up there, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a message that has just been resounding around the room today. There is only now, as a percentage of the population, 0.6% of us who are farmers in Australia. Now, when you know that stat, you know you cannot assume that anyone is going to understand your industry, and we have a responsibility to explain our industry. I did notice, I, I had 157,000 um, farmers, but I've noted in one of your publications, Mick, that I've read in the last 24 hours, it's 135,000. So that's an ABS stat from 2010. Maybe yes, the definition. <laughs> yeah, farmers, that's right. So look, but the key message there is just simply there is going to be less farmers in the future. And my point that I've already made is we've transitioned to an industrial model of farming. The great thing about that is, is that it's, in, it's given us greatly improved food um, safety. It's a dramatically improved product variety. We've seen an incredible increase, in, improvement in consistency of product. And, and we now almost take for granted reliable and nutritious food. But the result of that has been that people no longer see in the same way that my grandparents would never have been challenged as to whether they're farmers, people now question whether we are farmers. So a modern day farmer that is running an industrial scale business and employing 35 families, they're, they're not saying that they don't trust farmers, they're saying, are you actually a farmer? 
because they want to understand whether our form of production is a form of production that they can trust. And so and that's, that's based on what the cons consumer re research is, is saying. And so the key point, and I did put a rider on this, and the key point around the challenges is... Don't try this at home. I don't know. Yeah, don't try this at home. I don't... Yeah, well, do you know what? I did look at that and think... It's looking... <laughs> I actually reckon that steer got the better of that um, interaction anyway. But I did put the point on there, no, no animal was harmed in the making of this presentation. Um, but the challenges um, is the growing interest in animal activism. So in the 1970s, and it's, Paul did a great job of explaining this, um, it was very much all of the people who were studying um, any kind of activism or a, a, any law degree where they were going to go into an activist career were going into the environment. And it's now very much, and there's been a great proliferation in degrees offering um, uh, animal active, basic, basically a, a career where you can then become an animal activist. So this is um, an area that, and I think Lynn's probably really effectively demonstrated the psychological dimensions of this and why this is so, because we're getting to a point where people feel that we can care and, and we've got enough you know, wealth and richness, I guess, to be able to do that. But the key um, point, and I think this is really important to know about, and we certainly know this from our dealings with supermarkets, is that the change that we're starting to see is often about brand, prote brand prote protection, not actually about what consumers are really saying. So because of the, um, a range of different brands that we've introduced into the market, we're doing consumer research. And one of the things I find really interesting is that we don't get the same, and, and um, involved in industry groups that are also doing research, we don't get the same result as what the supermarkets are telling us is the concern around welfare. And we actually think that a large part of this is about companies protecting their supply chains. And whilst that's very valid, and it's certainly very important for those companies, it's not necessarily the consumer voice. So I 100% agree with Paul that one of the things we need is non-biased consumer research that actually tells us exactly what do people care about. The other thing that we also have found, and we found this consistently in the, in, with all of our brand research, is that when we ask people what are the important things, like what are the values that you want to see in the food, and they'll you know, give you some, we ask open-ended questions to try and find out what they're looking for, we then say, and are you willing to pay for that? The answer is no as well. So it's a really tickly issue for us. And so for us, we actually have to make a decision about where we position ourselves in the market and do we actually add extra value and add extra cost to the product that we're producing to deliver to a, a, a part, a niche part of the market, or do we stay in the main part of the market where there is no willingness to pay for additional attributes in your food? And, and, and that is a decision farms have to make. But the interesting thing um, that I wanted to mention in here is the pet effect. And that's really about the fact that most people's contact with animals now is actually limited to their pets. And so we have a very anthropomorphic view of the world and we want to be able to look after all animals as we look after our pets. And in Australia, most people do treat their pets like a member of their family. So it's a very human view of the world. And, and that is having a big impact. And that is, that is the voice that the animal activists can speak to effectively. Um, but the research does show that consumers do want to um, consume animal products, but they want to believe that they're... Con and I actually put a spelling mistake in here. I meant to put responsible humane way, but it ended up responsible human way, and I think maybe that's correct anyway. Um, but they need to have trust and confidence in us. Now, I thought I'd show you this slide, and it's a, it's a rough proxy, I'll agree. So this is about mortality rates in um, uh, egg production. And so you've got free range moving over to cage. And so you can see that, obviously, mortality rates in caged egg production is lower. And it's consistently lower, and it wouldn't, really wouldn't matter which research source I went and found for you, I could, I could demonstrate this. Now, I think it would be fair to say that's a rough proxy, because as, as, you, as you've seen in both Lynn and Paul's presentations, there's a whole range of other set of elements in here that we need to be ensuring that we're providing for animals. But I have to say this at the end of the day as a farmer, whilst death is a rough proxy. It's a really good indication of how the animal feels. <laughs> because a dead animal doesn't feel. 
And I know that is a cheap shot, and I acknowledge it's a cheap shot, but everything up to the point where that animal dies is that animal is under stress and is actually being put in a position where its ability to maintain its life and its feelings are being reduced. So this is, whilst a cheap shot is a really important thing to understand about how the farmers are feeling about this issue. So I guess my point is, is that the changes demanded aren't necessarily about what science tells us is better welfare. And if I were to give you the example in the pig industry, uh, one of the things we all desperately want to be able to um, keep is obviously farrowing crates because of piglet welfare, and because of much higher mortality of piglets um, without farrowing crates. We've all you know, successfully moved over to group sale housing and taken gestation stalls out of our production systems. Um, it was funny, I had one journo who came to the farm and she said, can you hop in there and just kiss one of the sows? And this is the sows that were in group sow housing. They'd just, come, they'd just been preg tested. They'd just been brought back in um, to their, um, their shed. And I said, can I just tell you that I'm not their handler. They have a handler who has a relationship with them and we're very, we're very intent on um, our staff having relationships with the animals because we just simply, it's, a, it's just the best way to, to grow animals. And um, I said, look, I'm not the handler. And the second thing is, is that this is when these girls are the grumpiest. <laughs> and if I were to jump in that pen to go kiss a sow, I would probably end up in an awful lot of trouble because they would see me as, you know, an intrusion into their space. Um, so it's, it is about just explaining the basics to people, you know, and like, because I was standing outside the pen going, I'm not getting in, and I had to explain why I wouldn't get in because the, the, my safety would have, you know, I reasonably thought my safety would be at risk. So building trust and confidence. I did put a note on here, a couple of machines were harmed in the making of this presentation. Now, I do have to say to Cole, who was brave enough to put up one of his own photographs, um, we do have an insurance file with lots of photographs of machines we've wrecked. This one isn't actually one of ours, it's actually a New Zealand photo. So, I was pretty happy about that. Ah, <laughs> I did wonder whether you had tractors that big. <laughs> right, that's enough, I will stop slagging off New Zealand. So this is one of the key things that when I watched Charlie Arnott's stuff for the first time, I went, oh, this is so important to understand. And it's really simple, is that on this side, this is basically what is described as social license. And this is, unless we can demonstrate that we can meet expectations through self-regulation, we tip this over and we therefore incur greater regulation, greater compliance and greater cost. This was a slide where I went, oh, I need to stop talking to rural audiences. I have to stop talking to farmers. I have to go start talking to people who are actually going to influence whether I continue to have my social license to farm, and that isn't farmers. Sadly, it's not. Um, and that was a really important one, and this is the second one that actually showed me what I needed to do. And this model basically says is that shared values are three to five times more important than, tr than demonstrating competence. So we think it's about demonstrating we're doing the right thing and that we're good at what we do, we're good farmers, we're productive farmers, we make a profit, but what they are actually saying is, can I trust you and can I believe in you? And so you need to establish shared values first rather than explaining to people, and I'll show you another one at the moment, uh, in a moment, that explains it even better, is they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that was my breakthrough where I went, I'm no longer going to show them. I used to show photos of our pigs in the pen looking healthy and beautiful and running around and looking happy. I don't do that anymore. I show photos of me nurturing pigs. Mind you, that pig didn't want any nurturing on that day, I've got to tell you. He got away. He was our runaway pig that day. But um, I now actually demonstrate our relationship to animals and that we care for our animals. And I hadn't really understood before then because I just assumed everyone would know. Like you grow up on a farm, you just assume everyone gets the fact that you love animals. And some of us, I kind of think about the world, the kids that grow up on farms, they're really good with machinery or they're really good with animals. And I was one of the kids who was really good with animals. So I just always assumed people got that. But it's a really good model because it actually, really, that, that model from Charlie um, made me understand is that what I actually have to show people is A, that I care, and B, why I care. So how do we do this? Um, I agree with Paul. We need to really research and understand the motivations. 
but I think what's even more important is we have to be delivering our own message because if we're not, someone is going to be doing it on our behalf. And we can't whinge if we don't like the message at that point because we haven't delivered the message ourselves up to this point. I think the other really key point up here is about resource the trusted key opinion leaders. There are people who will get on a television, get on a stage, talk to people who people just go, I like that person and I trust them. And when we find those people, we've got to get behind them. Because there are people that we also, and I've put this here, we need academic expertise to en enhance credibility. We need the data, we need the information, but people actually don't want to listen to academics. They want to listen to people who are doing the job, who are using academic research to back up what they've been able to do in the production system. So it's really important that we step up the media partnerships and we build strong links and go-to relationships. So before something happens, we're actually going to get the information from people and we know we've got a crisis coming and we can respond. So once again, it's back to this key point that people trust farmers, but they're not sure that what we're doing is farming. So we need to show them that, that our almost corporatized, industrialised style of farming is actually fa family farming. And this was, this was the next one, and I think this might be the end of my diagrams for the day, is that um, it's really quite critical that, and th this, is, this is what you see every farmer or industry association when they jump on the telly, we're learning to do this a bit better now, but if you have a look at the scientifically verified and the economic viable boxes, now what do we do when we get challenged on how we produce our animals? Well, actually the science shows that this is the best way to produce an animal and I've got the science to demonstrate it and plus it's the most profitable way to do it. But what's the problem with that? The problem with that is that we haven't done the first thing, which is we haven't told them why we care and therefore hearing that either the science or the economics backs us up is not a conversation that's even heard. So we have to start at the most simple point, which is this is why I give a shit about my pigs. Because if I just tell them that looking after my pigs is the most profitable thing I can do, or if I just tell them that, well, actually, I've got, you know, heaps and heaps of science and heaps and heaps of data that backs up what I'm doing, I'm not actually conversing with people at a level where they're going to listen to me or where they even trust me. So I have learnt to tell people that it's not just that we care for our animals, and it's not just that we care for our land, and it's not just that we care for our community, but we do all of that. We, we want to run a profitable business because it actually helps us to do that better. And it's funny because that's the thing I believe deeply and a thing that I have done my entire life, and I bet every farmer in this room is the same. It's why you are who you are, but we never think to tell people. So we don't have a methodology or a process across our industries to have this conversation about food, and at the moment, there's really good efforts, and I'm seeing them, and I'm going, great, that farmer's doing a great job. I must send them an email and tell them that's fantastic. I'm noticing that, that's great. But we need to generate more impact, and we need to be more strategic, and we need to work across industries. This is the US model, and it's, I think, just the most fantastic way of describing the holistic model. Their engaged training is about making sure farmers are trained to be able to do presentations and lots of presentations and they organise the presentations and they get the farmers there. The Farmer Resource Centre provides the backup information and the data and the training so that the farmers are able to be out there on and creating that platform. The crisis planning is about making sure that people are trained in how to talk um, at a point where there is um, any kind of an event that occurs. The thing in Australia, and if you watch this, we'll all know this, this is so true, an event occurs, we all get enraged. We all take action, we all get out there, and then we go back to being busy again. And then the next crisis happens, and we all get enraged. And then, you know, there's a fair bit of action, there's a fair bit of attention, and then we all go back to being busy again. And that's our problem. We've got no process in between times, in between the events, and we've got no ongoing process for making sure that we have farmer voices on the television, out there talking to the public. Um, so we need a process to deal with events. And the events, I agree with Lynn, are only going to escalate. We need the process for what we do between the events. And we need, in farm, we need farmers engaged for between the events. So finally, in closing, I said to start, whilst our commitment to do the right thing has never been stronger, we need to build trust and confidence that modern day farming 
is not only good for animals, it's good for the environment and it's good for the whole of Australia and that they can trust us to produce animals on their behalf in the most humane way possible that enables that, that animal to have dignity of life. Thank you, the pig lady.